had the fool who doesn't realize he's about to be trapped behind a wall, and the fiend who is there just shining with a big smile knowing he's going to kill this man. And so he, he looked at it and said, fool, fiend, fool, fiend, fools and fiends. So he, we worked under that title, um, and it, it stuck for that particular show. And, and the, there was a period of time where the title of the show would change almost daily. Um, weekly. Yeah. Okay. So um, you and Jonathan formed a company called Clunes Associates. Uh, what was the derivation of that, that name? Clunes Associates was Jonathan's family in Scotland, family heritage Clunes. And um, since we were two people, we were a partnership and became associates. Um, it was registered in the city hall in New York City. Uh, it was very symbolic for him and keeping his heritage uh, close to his heart. He, he loved his family history and as you probably have seen, he had these amazing black binders which trace the history of his family, his childhood, and his career. And that was one of the first things that he actually... Jonathan had a great habit of um, getting people to work for him for free. Um, <laughs> And I say this with all due respect, you know, I mean, it started in the studio days when he used to have the, the fan mail parties. I mean, and my, my grandmother would call these um, Tom Sawyer fence painting parties. Um, because he, and he would, I mean, there was one time that we cleaned his basement. What we were doing cleaning Jonathan Fridge's basement, I'm still not entirely clear on 30 years later. And he didn't lift a box. He just sort of was the conductor. And I think maybe we got dinner afterwards. Oh, okay. absolutely, Pete Stammer. Right, I mean, the, he was an extremely generous guy. He would always buy us dinner, you know. Um, so in that sense, he was great. But, you know, he, he was smart enough to know that there were a lot of people who loved and respected for him and, and respected him and were willing to throw their talents and energies into supporting what he did, which is kind of, kind of what we did. Now, um, as Jonathan's manager as well as the co-producer of the show, you were in the position to receive offers. Did Jonathan turn anything down in that period that people might be interested in hearing? There were a couple of things that he turned down. I would say nothing of great significance that I recall. Like but, horror movie scripts. And, yeah. Right, it was more along our appearances again at other types of horror events perhaps. Um, but Jonathan just joined us from Beyond the Grave, <laughs> which is so appropriate if you know Jonathan. Uh, but the um, major job the offer that came through was to do Arsenic and Old Lace on Broadway. Anybody here see Arsenic and Old Lace with Jonathan in the 80s? Great. He was cast as Jonathan Brewster, which was when there was originally done, Bella Lucy. Boris Carlos. Boris Carlos, excuse me. Marlis Carlo played the part, and A. Pagoda was playing it on Broadway. What the producers did was they said, we want to take the show on the road for what was to be six months, a national tour, and they wanted to say that the Broadway cast went on the road. But some of the actors did not want to stay with a national tour, one of them being A. Pagoda. So Jonathan and the other actors who came in were on Broadway for three weeks and then went on a national tour which was just supposed to be six months, but ended up uh, being even longer. Right, but while other people might have said, okay, well, let's put the one-man show on the back burner, Jonathan did just the opposite, correct? Jonathan was concerned because we had just had our premiere, as Will mentioned, on October 1986, and Arsenic and Olace, he was going into rehearsals in November and would be performing in December. And he said, I don't want to stop the show. And I said, I am going to get the schedule from the PR office of where you're going, and I'm going to contact small theaters, libraries that are in those cities, and ask them to book your show on a Monday night off, because Arsenic had eight performances a week, or maybe even, could you do Jonathan at 11 o'clock at night after an Arsenic and Olays? And he said, I'm game for anything. So it was quite amazing to think here he was doing eight shows a week, and would then perform Fools and Fiends, which he did in Philadelphia and DC. So we got several bookings, and then I was working particularly, the tour was scheduled to end in June, I was working particularly on the summer, where he got longer engagements, and rather than just one performance one evening, he was booked at a theater in Bluesburg, Pennsylvania, for three performances, booked in Chicago for five performances. 
So, uh, so he was definitely going to be very busy when he finished the tour. What surprisingly came up was the tour was so successful, they said, we want to do it again. And uh, they actually started up again, and I believe it was January of the next year again for another six months. And again, I was trying to find him engagements in the towns that he was performing in. And this is a man who is, what, 63 years old? Doing um, eight, show, eight Broadway shows a week, plus one-man shows in addition to that. He was very excited to be back on the boards, as he referred to it, as an old theatrical expression, two boards and a passion. And Jonathan absolutely had a passion for acting, and two boards was all he needed was the stage. Right, now I think people realize that Jonathan did these shows, but I don't know that they realize the extent and, and uh, ferocity uh, with which he pursued this. Um, how many shows would he do in an average year? Um, the big year for uh, the first big year, so with 86, 87, we eased in 88, about 65 performances, 89. So there's more than one a week? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, and then again, about uh, 60 and 89, uh, 90 started to drop down. And then um, as we got into 91, I sat down with Jonathan and said, as we look ahead, I've just been promoted, uh, uh, got in light, and this is getting, as much as I love this work, it's really taking up so much of my time that I, I need to, to step away, so would you like to hire someone to replace me? And he said, no, let's just sort of wind down, say by 92, I'm thinking of retiring back to Canada. And uh, I said, great. So by 92, our performances had dropped to like half. I think in the last year it was about 30 performances. And in the last couple of years, though, we added two additional shows, right? Right. Well, as well as What was amazing is he was having a lot of fun, and he wanted to even go back to some of the colleges that he had been at. And so he said, let's create a new program. So we had one called Jonathan Fritz for Ridiculousness, which had a lot more humor in it than Fools and Fiends. And the other show, which of course Shakespeare, which was close to his heart, uh, Jonathan Prince of Shakespeare in Odyssey. So he did return to even the original Sadler Regina College to perform those two shows in uh, 1991. So here's the question I think everybody would like to know. What were the challenges of working with Jonathan Prince? Well, Jonathan absolutely was an actor who would continue to analyze a character, a scene, a story, even after he'd done it. 50 to 100 times. He would want to go over it and over it and find nuances and, oh, here's some subtext I never realized was there. Um, and uh, so at times I'll be, well, let's maybe move on to something else. No, 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 let's go back and work on this. Um, but I so admired that his desire to keep working and not never sort of sitting back on his laurels. He's coming up with new ideas and new places. We had a number of, of Great, great fan support, and they would call me and say, hey, I know a theater that might want him, I know a library association, I know a, a very small a venue, would he be willing to do that? And he traveled, he was in, uh, people would be surprised to hear, Fayetteville, Arkansas, he was in Idaho, he was several various parts of Pennsylvania. And on a cruise, right? And uh, we did a Caribbean cruise uh, line, uh, which again, some of our wonderful people in the audience were there. Uh, and um, he adopted that script actually, so he would have, it was slightly, it was Fools and Fiends, but he called it Evil Eye because he changed some of the stories. That was probably a transition time when he was working on Ridiculousness. And um, he could adapt if somebody wanted to, sh like a one act as opposed to two acts. He would be willing to say, let me sit down and look at the script. And in fact, he was here in Tarrytown at the Old Dutch Church. I don't know if anyone was here for that performance. But he took Fools and Fiends, but he added a version of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. So it was legend, it, was, it was an adaption, because it was a long story, but he broke it into two parts, and so it was Fools and Fiends, and then right, we had part one, intermission, part two, he finished Legend of Sleepy Hollow and went back to Fools and Fiends. What he didn't know was, right as he finished act one, they had a headless horsemen go by the windows of the old church. <laughs> Which surprised me too. Which I'm sure he was thrilled at. Yeah. So we're going to take questions in a minute. So folks, if you want to line up, anybody with a question for Mary or for me at the microphone there in the center of the house.